CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Once again, we are fortunate enough to bring you an extraordinary tale from the pen of H.G. Wells. This, one of his stories from the classic Time Machine. Herbert George Wells, born over a hundred years ago, had a bold, creative power that not only captured the spirit of the future, but has excited and stunned the millions who have been spellbound by his vision. Eduardo, what are you doing? Just making sure all the black box are secure. Go back to speak, Carlos. I saw something flashing in your hand. What are you taking out of that man? Quiet. We will wake them up. Eduardo. You're stealing. <laughs> She'll never miss it. What is one little diamond to a woman with all that money? <laughs> mystery drama, Search for Eden, adapted from a story by H.G. Wells, written especially for the Mystery Theater by Gerald Keene, stars Lloyd Batista. I'll be back shortly with Act One. To begin this imaginative account by H.G. Wells, let me start by reading to you how he begins the story. 300 miles from Chimborazo, 100 miles from the snows of Cotopaxi, in the wildest wastes of Ecuador's Andes, there lies a mysterious mountain valley cut off from the world of men. But our story first unfolds in the city. Another beer, Eduardo? Well, I might as well. Why not? Waiter, make that two beers. <laughs> Carlos, I must be crazy sitting here in this street cafe. <laughs> I've never accused you of being completely sane. No, I'm not joking. Here we sit, the two mountain climbers on these uncomfortable little chairs at a dirty little table in a cafe in the middle of the noisiest, smelliest city in all Ecuador. Why are we here? What in the name of St. Sebastian are we doing here? Drinking beer. Drinking beer. <laughs> when we should be on some high mountain. <laughs> but to enjoy our profession, one needs money. And while there is beauty on a mountain path or clear water in a brook, <laughs> there's no money in it. Money. <laughs> I despise it. I notice that about you, Eduardo. That's why you're always at the racetrack or with the money lenders or gambling. <laughs> My old friend, I know you. You'd do anything for money. Yeah, maybe what I hate is not having it. All our equipment needs repair. The cleats of my boots are worn down, useless. Our rope's too heavy. We need a new lightweight kind. I'm not even mentioning a whole new set of pitons. But we don't belong in the city. You will agree to that. You haven't heard a word I said. This is where the money is. At sea level. This is where you find the tourists. A at the Excelsior Hotel. There is a Mr. and Mrs. John Murray from San Francisco. San Francisco, USA. Uh, don't interrupt. Mr. and Mrs. Murray are looking for a guide. They wish to climb the Andes. Oh, 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 oh. Not all the Andes, just the nearest. And how do you know all this? I've already talked to them. Tomorrow morning, you and I together will meet them. Ah, is this definite? Who do you think is paying for these beers? Mr. and Mrs. Murray. Tell you gentlemen, my wife and I have traveled extensively all over the world. We've done the Matterhorn and the Jungfrau. I mean, we've been up there, haven't we, Margaret? Oh, yeah. So I said to her, I said, Margaret, I said, here we are in Ecuador. Here we are, and right here on our doorstep, so to speak, the most beautiful mountains in the entire world. And that's where you gentlemen come in. Well, so then you are not novices to mountain climbing. You heard, Mr. Murray Carlos. Matterhorn, Jungfrau. Well, now that you put it that way, not exactly climbing, I'd say. I wouldn't say that, would you, Margaret? No. You went mountain climbing, but you did not climb? I didn't say that. I said we went up the Matterhorn and the Jungfrau. We went up as far as the funicular would take us. Uh, the cable car, that is. It's uh, 
quite a scary climb. I mean, you, you you have to have a feeling for heights to enjoy it. Wouldn't you say that, Margaret? No, oh, yeah. But this time, no little trolley car hanging in the air for us. No, sir. On our feet. So, uh, what say, gentlemen? Well, there are many beautiful places in the mountains, and I would suggest that the first climb be a modest one. Modest? You mean, uh... Not too high. Uh, Carlos is right. You know the air is very thin in the Andes, and you must uh, acclimatize yourself to it gradually. But how do you feel about that, Margaret? No point our wearing ourselves out first time round, eh? I have heard of a mysterious hidden valley somewhere in the Andes Mountains, which is like an Eden. Is that true? Oh, Mrs. Murray, no one knows. There is such a legend that this Eden in the Andes Mountains does exist. But I will see this. There is not one mountaineer the whole length of the Cordilleras who has not tried to find that valley. Could we look for it? Kind of a Shangri-La, is it? Well, how about that, gentlemen? How about that? Shangri-La or bust? We could take you up into the area where it is believed this valley of Eden exists, but the chances are we wouldn't find it. Can we make that our first climb? Yes, Mrs. Murray, we can undertake that climb. But it would be advisable not to be your first. Uh, see, Carlos is right. Let us make it the second or the third or fourth time. And you will be all of the more experienced mountaineers by then. Well, now then, gentlemen, if you don't mind, Margaret and I are going into town to do a little shopping. We always like to look for gifts for the folks back home. Uh, uh, say, uh, how much do you fellas need to start us off the first day? I know you don't have to tell me equipment, food, whatever it takes. Well, I got my trusty little checkbook right here. Now, what would you say? Thousand to start it off? Is that so, Chris? Or dollars, Mr. Murray? Well, I should say not good old American USA dollars. Yes, sir. And I'll come downstairs with you to the hotel desk to make sure they cash it. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing like being rich. Oh, in the ten years we've climbed together, you spent nine of them talking about money. I have. I know I have. That is because I never had much. <laughs> Did you notice the size of that diamond Mrs. Murray was wearing? Oh, oh, it flashed like the lighthouse at Guayaquil. I saw it. You never stop, do you? <laughs> you can't talk about the love of mountaineering and let them believe there is an Eden somewhere which everyone has been looking for since the Incas. But I, I climb for money. Eduardo, just suppose, if you and I could find that valley, farmlands, peace, like the beginning of civilization, unspoiled, what would you do? Oh, Carlos, to tell you the truth... I don't know if at my age I could appreciate such a place. I could. I could give up all this so-called civilized life like that. If I were to find that Eden, I would never come back down the mountain. You forget one thing, my boy. So you find this Eden, this garden. Then you are like Adam. But what good is this Eden to you, Adam, without an Eve? <laughs> Nah, come. Let us finish our drinks and go to the stores and buy the best of climbing gear they have to sell. I must say, Eduardo, I never thought we'd be caught in a blizzard sitting in a tent miles up on the side of a mountain. How long do these blizzards keep up, Eduardo? Yeah, this one could keep going all night. But we will know better when Cardos gets back. How can he tell tricks around out there? Well, why don't we ask him when he gets back here? Yeah. I would advise the both of you to climb into your sleeping bags just in case. Just in case what? Yeah. I don't wish to alarm you, but the last time Carlos and I were caught in such a snowstorm, suddenly a great wind came up and carried our tent into the air like a great sail. So we always advise, remain in your sleeping bags. Good thinking. You see, Margaret? You get what you pay for. You hire experts, you get expert attention. Hey, here he comes. Oh, stay where you are. Uh, I'll tie the tent flap fast on the inside. It's nasty out there. Carlos, you're covered in ice. You look just like a snowman. Well, I'll get my hood off. How is it, Carlos? Oh, I think we're in for it. I made about 50 meters in both directions. We're a little protected by a snow peak above us. That ought to hold back some of the winds. Any signs when it'll let up? Well, there's no way of being sure, Mr. Murray. But we are perfectly safe here. Yeah. So, 
This is where we spend the night, eh, Carlos? Where we've no choice. If it stops by morning, can we keep on going? I wouldn't like to promise it. I think it would be wise if we turn back. Don't you agree, Carlos? Well, yes, I do. I'm sorry, Mrs. Murray. I know you had your heart set on finding that hidden valley. But I think it's the wrong time of year. Well, can't have everything. We've had a week of different climbs, and I, for one, am very satisfied. I'm so disappointed. Are you sure we can't find the Eden Valley? Mrs. Murray, I would like to find it as much as you would. It's the dream of my life. But right now, the best thing for us to do is to get inside our sleeping bags and settle down for the night. Eduardo and I will keep watch. And we'll keep this lantern lit. It's more comforting to have a light burning during the storm. Making certain all the packs are secure. I saw something flashing in your hand. What do you have there? It is not enough. I'll be quiet or you would wake up, Mr. and Mrs. Murray. I'm getting up. Eduardo, let go of me. You're twisting my arm. Give me what's in your hand. I will not give you. Eduardo, you're stealing. We'll never visit what is one little diamond to a woman who has all that money. What? Is that you? Is that noise? It is nothing. Nothing. It is something. An avalanche. Oh. An avalanche? I'm going outside to see which way it's heading. Eduardo, keep everyone here. It's coming from the snow pack. missing the tent and its three occupants. Next morning, the sun rose on a landscape completely changed by the avalanche. Eduardo searched for hours for his partner. He found nothing. He led his party back down the mountain, then gathered together a rescue party. For Carlos has completely disappeared. I shall be back shortly with Act Two. again to the author of this tale, Mr. H.G. Wells, who tells us that the mountaineer fell a thousand feet and came down in the midst of a cloud of snow upon a deep snow slope. Down this he was whirled, stunned, and insensible, but without a bone broken in his body, and then at last lay still, buried amidst the white masses of snow that had saved him. I called an animal fall over here. No, doctor. It was over here. Put your hand down and touch the big hole in the snow. Yes, Miguel, you are right. Perhaps it is good for eating. Whatever animal it is will have broken its neck, so we have no fear of it. Reach down with me into the snow. Hey. Hello. Well, what is it? Listen. This animal speaks with our tongue. Oh, where am I? Am I dreaming? Uh, hello up there. Can you pull me up? A man from the snow. Miguel, if we reach far down, we can both lift him. You hold him by one arm. I hold him by the other. Ready? I have him ready to lift. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, where am I? Who, who are you? He is a poor creature, this man of the snow. He knows nothing. Oh, it's a miracle. Nothing broken. I can't stand. He oh. speaks like a man. But you, you, you don't have to help me. I can stand alone. Touch his face. Oh, what are you doing? Feel the coarseness of his hair. He's coarse like a llama's hair. Come along with us, man from the snow. We will hold you and guide you. A man. Oh, you are walking well. That's it. Uh, that's I don't know why you don't let me walk by myself. I am a doctor. I decide. You are in perfect snowman. And you will fall. We will take care of you. You've fallen into our world. He must have come from the roof. <laughs> well, I've come from over the mountains. From way up there on the other side. Halfway up to the sun. 
way up where there is mist, and above that, the roof. I assure you, you don't have to drag me along like this. Oh, he's a stubborn one. I have a good mind to let him find his own way. Oh, no, doctor. The elder says we must be kind to the imperfect one. What are you talking about, imperfect? If I wasn't in such good physical shape, I'd be dead now in that avalanche. Ah, I see where we're going. The snow line ends and there's a path through green fields. Ah, yes, I can see. See? What is sea? Imagine. Way up there it is winter. Down here it is summer. Oh, very strange. He talks much, doesn't he? But his words are uh, elusive. No question. We must take him directly to Juan, the elder. Who is that? Juan, the wise man of our village. <sighs> there you are. You stumble. If I hadn't caught you, you would have fallen again. Well, I'm a little shaky, that's all. I've been caught in an avalanche. Fallen thousands of feet. Naturally, on unfamiliar path, I'm not very steady. But I can see where I'm going. You are doing very well. I think we needn't hold him by the arms. We can leave him by the hands. Oh, I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Now that I look at you closely, I, I understand. You are both blind, aren't you? Blind? What is blind? Oh, we've walked a long way. It's beautiful, and your little village is so most quaint. But I don't understand why the houses have only doors and no windows. Do you know what he's talking about, Doctor? It does not matter. One can't pay attention to every aberration of the mind. Well, why are we standing in front of this big cave at the end of your big street. Go in, snowman. You first. In there is Juan, the elder. Oh, it's so dark in here. I can't see a thing. Oh, you have falling. Who, who, who is it? Who fed on me? What are you doing? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. It's pitch black in this cave and I can't see a thing. I, I'm sorry I fell over you. Doctor, Miguel, who is this? A poor unfortunate we found in the snow. He's full of contradictions. He says he can see, or now he says he cannot see. Sit up, you. I'd be glad to. I don't understand why you're here in the dark. What means dark? Of course. So stupid of me. I beg your pardon. You, Juan the Elder, you are also blind. Uh, I am so sorry. You see what craziness he talks, Juan? Leave us, doctor. And thank you for bringing him to me. I wish to talk with this man. You say your name is Carlos. Oh, yes, I'm a mountaineer. Last night, or it may have been the night before, I was caught in an avalanche. I was carried miles and miles and then dropped in a snowbank not far from here. So by the grace of God, I am alive. May I call you Juan? By all means, Carlos. I cannot see your face in the dark, but your voice is warm and comforting. It is by voice, sounds to our ears, touch to our fingertips, that we know one another. So you cannot see either, Juan. You are also blind. Try to explain to me what is this uh, see. There is no one in this valley who would understand you. Sound and touch, yes, and smell and taste. Yes, that we know. It is all there is between men. We love, bring children into the world, farm the fields, harvest the crops. We like nothing. Your whole village uses only their fingertips and their voices to know one another? Young man, there is no other way. Ah, so. You are all blind. Give me your hand. I will guide it to the edge of a post of wood that has always been in the center of this cave. Come. Can you feel it? I, yes, I can. Now, as you move your hand, count the cuts in the wood. Go on. Two, four, five, seven. Go on, go on. Um, Twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Fourteen generations have left their mark there. Fourteen generations have kept together, farming, weaving, building, 
all by sound and by touch. There is nothing else. Good Lord. This is the country of the blind. Ah, oh, Carlos. I am asking too much of you. You have fallen from great height. And you said your brain is, of course, somewhat muddled. One can expect that. Do, do not draw away. I put my hands to your face. This is your nose, yes? We have noses, too. But here, I feel strange, feather-like things on either side of your nose. Those are eyelids. A little hairs on them to keep the dust away from... Oh, it's no use. I, I can feel the little hairs. They move so fast, these eyelids. And there is a, a, a lump under each one. Those lumps are my eyes. Eyes? Oh, they are what I see with. Uh, we will be kind to you, Carlos. We are a good people. We shall make space for you to live and give you food. And perhaps you will work in the fields with everyone else. Living there in that dark cave? Oh, no, no. This is the village meeting place. My daughter, Eva, will show you two quarters of your room. Eva, will you come out, please? Are you always this kind to strangers? There have never been strangers. You were the first visitor in 14 generations. But because a man comes to us from the snow, a man who is not whole, who has uh, deformities of the face or talks in meaningless gibberish, we will not send him away. You are welcome here. Ah, ah, this is my daughter, Eva. Eva, this is Carlos. He came with a snowfall. An avalanche dumped him into our valley. You will make sure he has a place to sleep and food to eat. Yes, Father. I shall. You are Eva. And you are Carlos. Oh, your hair is the same color as mine. Color? What is color? Well, you have brown hair. So have I. Is brown hair something special? Hmm. I knew it is, Eva. You say that in a nice way. You must have had a nice thought with it. The sound of the voice tells the feelings in the heart. Oh, you turn here, Carlos. But how do you know? There is a notch in the curb which tells me. All our streets are made at right angles. But I have lived here all my life. Of course, I know my village. <laughs> it's a miracle to me how an entire village can live so harmoniously and so well without fear. <laughs> no one here feels deprived of anything. Whatever this scene is, it doesn't exist. Ah, this is your door. You go in here. What? None of these houses, none of them have windows. Why? Windows? What are they? Or to look out of, to let the light in. Oh, what can I be thinking of? Of course, you would have no need for them. But I would like to learn what windows are. I better hide if we are going to be friends. <laughs> brought you a bowl of llama's milk and some salted bread. Why are you up here on the steps, Carlos? Well, it was too dark inside a little house. <laughs> Besides, I love to watch sunsets. What is this dark that you don't like? This time of day when the tiny animals make their music. I like it too. You say day, Eva, but to you, what difference is there between day and night? Oh, a great deal. Night, animals sleep, we sleep, the earth becomes cool. You know, I'm sitting here, and I can see the golden red color of the sun going behind that mountain in the sky, going from light to deep blue to purple. Oh, and I am sad that such a beautiful girl as you has never seen it. I wish you would stop. We have been kind and welcomed you. And your mouth is filled with untruths and lies and fears that bring up the anger in me. 
There are no mountains. The end of the rocks where the Lama's grave is the end of the world. Oh, no. And over all of us is a smooth roof of stone from which the dew and the snow and the rain fall. Ava, it isn't so. There is a sky millions of miles high and, and clouds and stars and a moon all turning in space as we are. No. There is no roof. The world is a round ball spinning in a limitless no, void. Stop. Stop it. I won't hear any more. How can you lie like that? I won't listen to you anymore with your made-up words that make me so angry. No, all right. All right. I had better go to see your father again. He's a man of learning. He's my only hope. Please, Eva, lead me to him. Eva tells me you are feeding her ears with strange talk. Unfamiliar, perhaps, but not strange. Do you remember telling me I was the only stranger who had ever come here? Think back and tell me. Did anyone ever leave this valley? Oh, yes. Years ago, I am told, at the time of my grandfather's grandfather, men walked beyond the rocks where the Lamas graze, and they must have fallen over the edge, who knows where. Oh, they didn't die. They came to my land and spoke of this valley. They called it Eden, after a garden where man first lived. You say the world does not end at the edge of those rocks? More than that. I say that world where I came from is not as happy a place as you have in this valley. That's why I climb mountains. And you think here you have found your Eden? And I'm terribly afraid that I have. And I'm happy. Why? Why I'm happy? Because it makes me realize the only way man can live without war and disorder, the only way he can exist in peace, man with man, is to be blind. Yes, our young mountaineer is unhappy, even desperate. Alone, he returns to the house they gave him, throws himself on the bed, but cannot sleep. Somehow, he must show these people there is a value to seeing. Especially Eva, the last person he wants to hurt. And the first person in his heart. I shall return shortly with Act Three. The Country of the Blind, H.G. Wells calls it. These people lived a simple life, he writes. They toiled. They had food and clothing. They had days and seasons of rest. They had music and singing. And there was love among them. Then why was it, in such an ideal community, that Carlos, the young mountaineer, was so desperately unhappy? Don't stand behind me, snowman, watching me spray the earth. Come forward. How did you know it was me, doctor? Your back is turned. Ah. Of course, I forgot. You don't need to see someone to know who it is. You have been here for so many days, and you still insist on foolish talk. <laughs> You're the only one in the whole valley who laughs at me. Quite true, Snowman, because I am honest. I would rather laugh out loud than hide pity and scorn, as they do. Now go away. I have a lot of spading to do. I suppose everyone in the valley is so healthy you can afford to spend time on your farm. Huh? Everyone works the land, whether he be doctor, butcher, shopkeeper, or even the elder. I didn't know that. I cannot dig properly with you hovering behind me. I'll go, I'll go. Carlos, you have no more powers than the rest of us have. Less. You stumble to distinguish sounds. Your stars and moons and looking and seeing and all those other words you fancy. Oh, yes. Colors, sunlight, ha! All lies. Now, why don't you leave us alone? Go back where you came from. I have heard you with Ava. Ava is not for you. I never said she would. Leave her alone. She's a sweet girl, not to be contaminated. Go away. You're not wanted here. <laughs> What are you doing with my spade? Put it down. I've had enough of your taunting, you ignorant blind man. I came here looking for peace. And it's those like you who have destroyed it. Now you're trying to destroy me. Get away from me. 
or I'll use this, do you hear? I've had enough of this. Come near me and I'll smash your skull. I must get away from him. Be by myself and think. Otherwise, I can't be responsible. No, man! Give me back my face! Carlos! 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 Come back! I see them all. A whole village of men. Uh, do they think I'm stupid? They're circling around me. Snowman! Give me back my spade, Snowman! My name is not Snowman. My name is Carlos. Snowman, we're coming! Put down the spade, Carlos! Juan, Juan, don't you understand? Tell them to go away and leave me alone. No, man. We have come to take this bed from you. You will hurt yourself. No, man. Crazy snowman. You can't see me. Any of you, you stupid blind bats. But I warn you, I am swinging this spade about my head. And if anyone comes any closer, they will be hit. Do you hear me? You will do as we say, Snowman. I'm going to do what I like in this valley. Do you understand? I am going to do what I like and go where I like. You have no idea, Doctor. I don't know where he's got to. Have you searched the village, the farms? Good riddance, I say. He was a troublemaker. We can't let him wander around alone. Suppose he comes to the end of our world, to the rocks, and falls to his death. So? Carlos is a human being. Afflicted with these eyes, as he calls them. Not normal. He has wild thoughts, lives in imagination, in dreams perhaps. But still, a human being. There you are, doctor. Ah, there, did you tell Juan that we found Carlos? You found him? Yes, both of us. I, uh... I was just about to. Doctor, that was sinful of you to pretend you didn't know where the poor man was. I am human, too. He was my spade. He took and threw in the tall grass where I can find it. My spade, he tried to attack us with. Doctor, is there not some other reason you have for hating our visitor? I have no other reason. You must not be jealous of the time Ava spends with him. Jealousy is not for us. We are all above that. Now, where is Carlos? Oh, he is on the furthest farm where the llamas find us with his grass. He must be very hungry. It has been three days. He won't starve. If the llamas can eat grass, so can he. Good for the digestion. A man, a human being, is hiding. Afraid of us. Afraid of himself. Water came from the roof above us twice. Since he ran away, he's in the fields, wet, hungry, perhaps desperate. Perhaps he found shelter. I hope so, Miguel. You say you found him in the furthest farm. Very well, I shall go myself. I'm sorry, Juan. I, I brought so much ill feeling to your village. Good. You are wiser now. And you are sorry. Yes, I am sorry. And do you still think you can uh, see? No. No, that was folly. That word means nothing. Less than nothing. Ah, good. I am glad you have realized that. One, one before you ask me any more questions. For pity's sake. Give me some food or I shall die. Father, may I speak with you? Yes, daughter. What is it? It is about our visitor, Carlos. He has found his place in our land. I know. I hear good reports in the many, many months that have gone by. You have? Seems to harvest every day. He has gone into the fields and gathered up the hay. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I am glad his madness has passed. He 
no longer talks about wild things. I would be untruthful if I said he does not. Oh? Oh, but only to me. To all the others in the village. He is one of us with the same beliefs, the same truth. But, Eva, there are not two truths. I caution you, see less of Carlos. He is not yet quite well. That is what I came to tell you, Father. He has asked me to marry him. What can I do? Ah, my dearest daughter. I know he has delusions, but they are getting better. Whenever he hears the approach of anyone in the village, he says everything that they think is right. I, I don't know what to say. I have always believed in following one's heart. He loves me. And Father, I love him. Doctor, did you examine him as I asked you to? I did, yes. He came to my house yesterday. And what is your opinion? I would say his case is clearer to me now. And I think, very probably, he might be cured. Ah, that is what I have always hoped. His brain is affected. And what affects it? Those two lobes on his face, which he used to call uh, eyes. I have not heard him mention them in a long time. No, he does not. And that is why I think there's hope. My conclusion is those eyes and what he calls eyelids are diseased in such a way as to affect his brain. Uh, how extraordinary. I have arrived at that conclusion because those eyelids in moving as they do rapidly cause his brain to be in a state of constant irritation and distraction. But you say there is a cure. Let me say with reasonable certainty that in order to cure him completely, all we need to do is a simple surgical operation. Namely, to remove the irritant bodies. And then, Carlos will be completely sane. Perfectly. Eva. I have come out to the field to talk to you. Well, did anyone see you? No. No one. All right, let's sit here. Uh, the high grass will hide us. Uh, Carlos, dear, I have told my father that we wish to be married. You did? Mm -hmm. But when? Oh, several days ago. What did he say? It was he who had the doctor send for you and examine you. Uh -huh. He was still a little worried that you were not completely like the rest of us. Would you want me to be? I don't know. But my father would. So, he had you examined and then sent for the doctor. Oh? He has told father that what you call your eyes could be removed and that you would be completely sane. Oh. Remove them? Mm. Is that what you wish? To have my sight taken from me? Our marriage would be assured, my darling. Father says so. Take away my gift of sight. Well, you haven't spoken of it that way in a long time. Ava, my world is sight. I pretend it isn't so, but we both know it is. I want to be your wife. What of all the beautiful things I would see no more? The flowers. The far sky with its drifting down of clouds. The sunsets and the stars. And there's you, Eva. For you alone, it's good to have sight. To see your sweet, serene face. Your dear face. Your beautiful hands folded together. Don't say those things to me. Instead, you offer me night and blackness. All I'm left with is to touch you, hear you, never see you again. Imprisoned under that roof of rock and stone and darkness. Would you have me do that? I want so much to be your wife, Carlos. 
Dear, dear Carlos. Oh, Lord in heaven, help me. Oh, dear, dearest heart, you will not be hurt. And you will go through all this for me. You will? I swear to you, my loving Carlos, that we shall be happy forever. And when must this take place? Tomorrow. Oh, so soon? Yes. Tomorrow, then? I shall see no more. I must go now and tell Father the wonderful news. Uh, Eva. Yes? I wanted to look at your face once more. To remember. Carlos bent down and picked up a flower. He didn't know its name, but he marveled at its petals and its color. Eva had almost disappeared from the field. Holding the flower, Carlos turned away from the Valley of the Blind and started to the mountainside where the snows began. He was a mountaineer, and he would climb again and search for another Eden. I shall return shortly. Whether one tries to surmount cliffs of stone, ice, or avalanches, or the hurdles of life below. We're all mountaineers. The quest for tranquility is in every heart. Rudyard Kipling, a friend of H.G. Wells, described our search when he wrote, Something hidden, go and find it. Go and look behind the ranges. Something lost behind the ranges. Lost and waiting for you. Go. Our cast included Lloyd Batista, E.B. Juster, Jackson Beck, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.